Peatlands are water. Peatlands are carbon. Peatlands are a place to live or make a living. And in some cases, peatlands are identity. Peatlands are complex ecological systems and various values have been attached to them. Because they have much to offer society, they need protection, but only what is known can be protected. So first, it is important to get to know them. One aspect that can tell you much about a peatland is the condition of the peat soil. The soil provides clues to the processes that have taken place at that site. Such information is crucial for making the right decision in peatland management. Therefore, peat soils are the focus of this video series. This video will show how peatlands develop, describe their current state in Germany, and explain why they are valuable. To begin with, what are peatlands? Peatlands are wetland ecosystems which develop in areas where there is an excess of water. Because decomposition is much slower under anoxic waterlogged conditions, the plants create more biomass than is decomposed. In this way, organic matter from vegetation accumulates. When the resulting material has at least 30% organic matter, it is called peat. Soil scientists and geologists define any area with soils containing at least 30 centimeters of peat as a peatland. And a peatland where peat is currently accumulating is called a mire. Depending on where the water which supplies the peatland comes from, peatlands are grouped into two major categories, fens and bogs. In the case of fens, the water comes from a larger catchment. These peatlands, which develop in depressions, are therefore groundwater fed. In fens, the vegetation is generally made up of wetland plants, which thrive on nutrient-rich groundwater. They include different species of sedges and rushes, often accompanied by brown mosses, which grow between the larger plants. Other types of vegetation can also develop in fens, such as reed beds or forest communities, especially alder cars. The dead underground parts of wetland plants, such as sedges, do not entirely decompose and accumulate over decades to centuries as peat. As long as the water supply is met, the peatland will grow and the peat layer can become several meters thick. Fens can be divided into several subcategories depending on how they formed. A classic case is when a lake forms in a depression in the landscape. In the beginning, the vegetation grows on the banks of the lake and peat accumulation starts in the shallow water near the shore and moves towards the center of the lake. At the same time, fine organic material and suspended mineral particles settle at the bottom of the lake. With time, the deeper areas of the lake will be filled with this substance, which is called yitsha. When the water level becomes shallow enough to allow for peat accumulating plants to grow, the lake will continually be filled. This is called a terrestrialization fen. There are also other ways a fen can form. For example, groundwater levels may rise gradually in a depression, for instance after a change in climate. Peat accumulates in the ever-growing saturated zone. This occurs parallel to the increase in groundwater level. Fens formed this way are called paludification fens. There are even more subcategories of fens. For example, spring fens, percolation fens, or floodplain fens. You can find more information about these mire types in the literature sources included at the end of this video. Now, onto the bogs. Water has a habit of coming from above. Bogs develop in areas with high rainfall and sites where the nutrient-poor rainwater cannot run off or seep away easily. They are fed solely by rainwater and are not influenced by groundwater. Bogs develop only in areas with high annual precipitation, 
In Germany, these areas are found mainly near the North Sea and the Alps, as well as some areas along the coast of the Baltic Sea and the central uplands. Some plants are well adapted to these conditions, especially mosses from the genus Sphagnum, also called peat mosses. These are accompanied by a few vascular plants such as heath and cotton grass. As long as the conditions are wet enough, peat mosses keep growing and growing. The dead parts of the plants accumulate as peat. Peat moss remains have a high water holding capacity and can, just like a sponge, absorb and hold on to water. This water can be brought right up to the surface by capillary action. In this way, layers of peat many meters thick can accumulate over centuries, creating dome-shaped protrusions in the landscape. Bogs can develop directly over the mineral soil or on top of already existing fens. As one can see, the height of the water table in the bog is dependent on the rainwater held in the peat. The groundwater is found much deeper underneath the bog peat. Peat in pristine mires is saturated almost up to the ground surface. In this way, peatlands in their natural state store huge amounts of water. Through its particular physical properties, peat can quickly absorb and hold onto water. Thus, peatlands are extremely important in regulating the water balance of the landscape. During wet periods, peatlands are able to absorb excess water and in drier periods, they give this water to the surrounding areas, either by natural draining or in the form of evaporation. This function is becoming increasingly important as long drought periods are expected to be more frequent due to climate change. Peatland growth originates from plants, which during photosynthesis remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to create carbon-rich organic material. Through peatland development, tremendous amounts of carbon are bound and stored in peat. Peatlands cover only 3% of the Earth's land surface, but they hold approximately 30% of the global soil carbon, much more than all of the forests in the world combined. As long as peatlands are wet, the carbon will be stored long-term. Peatlands are first and foremost wetlands which provide valuable habitat. They are the home of rare plants, essential breeding and stopover sites for countless bird species. As well as habitat for many mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and insects. In this respect, bogs carry a special importance. The nutrient-poor rainwater, as well as the high acidity produced by the peat mosses, create extreme conditions for plants. Only a few vascular plants can cope with these conditions and coexist with peat mosses. Many such species can only be found in bogs. Some have developed radical adaptations, such as the sundews of the genus Drosera. They have turned carnivorous in order to compensate for the lack of nutrients in the soil and water. Another aspect that makes bog plants stand out is their aesthetics. The landscapes they create with their unique colors are nothing short of breathtaking. Peat moss carpets of red, brown, and light green, the dark green of heath and heather plants, the soft cloud-like white of cotton grass, and the stark black and white of the downy birches blend into an unmistakable primeval beauty. Peat and peat soils are also an important resource. For centuries, peat has been cut and used primarily as fuel, but also as building material. Even today, peat is harvested. Nowadays, peat is an important raw material in the production of horticultural substrates. 
Until recently, pristine, wet peatlands had made up an important part of the landscape in Western and Northern Europe. In Germany, peatlands originally made up almost 5% of the land area. Such places were traditionally seen as wastelands. But in the last 250 years, and especially in the 20th century, many peatlands have been drained, usually as part of state-run land improvement and settlement projects. These lands were then converted to pastures, meadows, or arable land. Ninety-five percent of the original peatland areas in Germany have since been drained and are now in use, mainly for agriculture or forestry. Because peatlands are so complex and offer many different environmental functions that benefit nature and humans, different stakeholders often prioritize different aspects in peatland management. These goals are not always compatible with one another, especially when dealing with peatlands that have a long history of use. The main goals for nature conservation focus on peatlands fulfilling their habitat function for typical flora and fauna. For climate protection, peatlands should not become a source of greenhouse gases and ideally should be carbon sinks. However, this does not necessarily mean that the original species composition will be restored. And then there is agriculture. Hundreds of families have cultivated peat soils for generations. Their livelihoods and their identity as farmers depend on a profitable use of these peatlands. Still, the conventional agricultural use of peatlands is generally not compatible with the main climate and nature conservation goals. Peat extraction also creates a dilemma. Sites are generally restored after harvesting, mostly with good results if best practices are followed. However, peat extraction means loss of carbon from the soil. To date, no practical alternatives have been found to completely replace peat as an ingredient in horticultural substrates. So, there are no easy answers. In peatland management, different goals can be pursued like the preservation of pristine mires, re-wetting and restoring drained peatlands, or making their cultivation more climate friendly. In any case, it is always important to understand the current condition of a peatland and its soils. For that, we need to ask how peat soils change after drainage and long-term agricultural use, and also how soil surveys can inform decisions in peatland management. These questions will be addressed in the next video. Thank mm -hmm. you.